Good morning, and welcome to worship with us here at Jubilee United Church. I'm the Reverend Graham Brown Miller, lead minister here at Jubilee, and today I have assistance in leading worship from Barb Beerhouse and Bill Medland offering scripture and prayers from their homes, and Andrew here with me at the church. Thank you for joining us for worship today, wherever you are. We're grateful that you've chosen to be with us. We know that there are other places you could be. As an act of faith and reconciliation, we acknowledge that Jubilee United Church is situated on the shared ancestral and unceded lands of the Halkamalem and Homer speaking peoples. We equally respect each of the nations who share territory in what we call Burnaby. We recognize that when we come, we are different in many ways. And so whomever you are, however you need to be here, we affirm you and your presence, truly hoping that you find a place for yourself here. Coffee and pajamas are a fine way at being in worship. We don't always meet the mark of being a welcoming place or an inclusive place, but we strive to be a place of welcome. No matter how great or little you feel your faith is, no matter if it's your first time coming to this or any church, if you were raised here or it's the first time coming in a while, no matter what it is that you might think keep you from connecting to the source of all being, we hope that you find inclusion in what we do here. Often when we're in person, uh, you don't wanna talk to each other, but in this sort of way of being online, there are a variety of ways you can do that, including the chat box on Zoom if you're on a computer. Um, you might be moved by something that's said, or you might disagree, totally fine. Uh, but we recognize again, that we come differently uh, in all the ways that we are. We are different in our stage of life, in our theological expression, in our personalities, our gender identity and expression, our sexual orientation, our language, skin color, culture, race, marital or economic status, ability, and whether or not you find yourself to be a Christian, or if you have questions and doubts, what we share in common is our diversity. And in that, God is pleased. Our days are lengthening and we are preparing for the celebration of Easter. In the midst of this season of Lent, we light our Christ candle reminding us, reminding us that God's light shines in our world and through us, despite all the things which make it hard for us to witness to the light. The flickering candle that is here reminds us of the connectedness that we each have, that spark of light that is in each of us, that spark which comes from the light from which all light comes. Thanks be to God. Here, close to the end of Lent, we are called to walk to the paper thin edges which cut us to the soul, to the places which weary us, to the people who confuse us, to the faith which threatens some. Here at the corner of steadfast love and faithfulness, we are called to wait. When our clenched stomachs awaken us in the moments of unbearable sorrow with the angels who would carry us. Here where time is fulfilled, where God's kingdom is as near to us as our neighbor, we continue our Lenten journey with the beloved whose tears wash away our fears, with the God who will not let go of our hands. And so we bring ourselves to prayer, knowing that we seek reconciliation, that we seek wholeness, that God offers healing and wholeness to us. And so we pray. Sometimes we tiptoe through this life fearfully, worried that we will be shortchanged of what we need and what we want. Sometimes we slip through this life spitefully, supposing that grudges should be kept and forgiveness should be withheld. Sometimes we wander through this life obliviously, unaware that small and large miracles surround us. Sometimes we barrel through this life heedlessly, ignoring that there is goodness and beauty to be noticed. Sometimes we stomp through this life noisily, forgetting that you, O oh God, may just be waiting to meet us in the silence. And so we bring ourselves to silence, offering the prayers of our hearts. Forgive us for treading so gracelessly on this journey. Forgive us, but then outfit us with generosity, purpose, wonder, humility, and courage for the next leg of this journey with you. 
Amen. Friends, even when we tiptoe fearfully, slip spitefully, wander obliviously, barrel heedlessly, stomp noisily, even then God meets us and offers us love and grace, and we know that we are forgiven people, now and always. Thanks be to God. Amen. Children, youth, young at heart, all of you, uh, we have a story today. Um, we have a story every week. We tell our scripture story in a variety of ways. And so uh, for one way, though, is to tell our story a little bit differently, a little bit easier to understand. So we're going to put up uh, a, a version of the Spark Bible reading that we're going to hear later today. And it's there for you to look at. I'm not going to read it um, as it's written. But just to know that uh, if you're reading it while I'm talking, that's okay. You will hear the story read differently uh, from the New Revised Standard Version. But this is one of those where when we tell the story, sometimes the themes can get just a little bit too big. And so we know that people came to Jesus. They wanted to meet with him. And he was saying something about when a seed is planted in the ground, it dies so a new plant can grow with many seeds on it. And people ask what that means, and then all of a sudden a voice comes from heaven saying, it is time for me to keep my promise. And so Jesus tells people, he goes with people, he finishes teaching, and people begin helping and serving others following Jesus. I wonder, I wonder if Jesus asked you to follow him by helping others, what kind of things would you do? Some of them are things you might already be doing. Some of them might be things that you might be scared to do, but if you were asked to follow and help, what are some of the things you might do? It's a question for you to hold on to, to think about, to reflect on throughout the week. And uh, if you feel like sending me a response to that question, I'm happy to receive it too. You can phone me at the office, you can send an email, you can post it on Facebook, send me a tweet. I don't know how you're gonna get a hold of me, but there are so many ways. And so as you continue to hold on to that story, we hear our common faith story from scripture. A reading from the prophet Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their inequity and remember their sin no more. And a reading from the Gospel according to John. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will be my servant also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what, said, what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, 
This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death that he was to die. Hear what the Spirit is saying through these ancient words of scripture. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be graced by your wisdom and your love. Amen. As our Lenten season draws to a close and we prepare to hear of Jesus's triumphant entry into Jerusalem on what we've come to call Palm and or Passion Sunday next week, we hear these passages appointed for today. And in them, we cast our minds back to our common faith story and we confront some of the static in our lives, the things that draw us away from what we're doing and try to figure out where we go from here and possibly what this Lenten journey has taught us. This year, particularly, we think about the lessons that we've learned in our lives. What does it mean for things to die, to let them fall to the earth? What does it mean for God to bring us to new life and new possibilities? This passage from the gospel according to John challenges us to think about what that means. This is one of Jesus's final public teachings, which is then followed by his private goodbye to the disciples and then the passion narrative. Tensions have been rising, and now we've reached a breaking point. Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead, and this act and the excitement about it have set in motion the local authorities' plot to kill Jesus. The challenge from the Roman Empire, the way that they worked to find a new way to challenge and change what was going on. He says, very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. I'm really glad that this passage is paired with the one from Jeremiah. It too is a tough passage, but it brings something more. It adds context. It makes the story more full. It fills our lives. It's always important to flesh out the stories, to give us a bit more to work with, the way that we tell our own stories. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. I will put my law within them. And I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Do you hear the echoes in this story? Do you hear the reminder of Moses at Mount Sinai receiving the commandments? Do you hear the reminder of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Leah and Rachel and all of their children? The covenants that they were given that the ancestors would be greater than the stars in the sky the desert in, the, in the, the sand in the desert, their descendants would be numerous. In this Jeremiah passage, the prophet draws a sharp contrast to the covenant that God had made with the people at Sinai. I will be your God and you will be my people. A great deal of covenantal water has flown under the bridge since the Exodus event. The covenantal promises of choosing life or death by attending to the solitary claim of God on them has gone badly in Israel's life, lived in God's presence. They've done things that have broken the commandments. They've figured out ways that were made under Abraham, the agreement, the promise, sealed with the sacrifices of animals. In fact, the language of Hebrew says that God cuts a covenant with the people. With the people of God under Moses' leadership, the commandments were cut into, they were carved into stone. Here in Jeremiah, there is no third party. There's no middle ground to cut the promise with. Jeremiah has a new deal proposed by God between God and the people directly. Jeremiah says today, this deal, these terms are to be inscribed directly into the human heart. Really though, this new covenant isn't new in its content. It's not a new law, but a new ability to follow the law on humanity's part. A new ongoing intimacy with God. What will be new or renewed will be the inner life of human beings. God will write the law within us such that knowing God becomes second nature. As you know, music touches me deeply. We sang earlier a musical variation of this scripture. I heard it a long time ago and it has stuck with me. It's one of those things that's written on my heart. The one that we sang, the Deep within, I will plant my law. 
not on stone, but in their heart. The language in that song changes, though. It changes not the Jeremiah passage, but the covenant that had been written before. Do you hear that? The covenant was thou shalt not or thou shalt, but now it's about relationship. I will put, I will write, I will forgive. The gift of the law, already a pathway for living intimately with God, for knowing God in and through daily life, will become fully internalized. God tells the people that God has taken up residence in the hearts of the people. No longer is there a legalistic, tell me how to rule oriented life that is necessary. No longer do we need others to tell us what we need to know about God. It simply takes looking within our own hearts, God's home. Yet sometimes we forget this. So we do require people to remind us of this good news. There is a covenant an assurance of pardon. There's transformation of our lives and our life together. There is a future filled with hope. All because God is at work, as God has always been, in the midst of the people. Walter Brueggemann calls this the core memory of Israel, that God will do today in this bad circumstance what God has done in the past. The covenants have been broken, the Big Ten from Sinai, Things are bad, but still notice God uses words like new, heart, and covenant once again. It's a new creation, a new covenant, a new exodus, a new land of distribution. This isn't God working simply out of a deep wounded love and profound grief. God has moved beyond anger to tender care and most importantly, forgiveness. This text is about a thing of the heart. God determines that this time the Torah, the law, will be written not on stones, not on something external, but deep within, something inside the people. Though in many ways it's new, this covenant doesn't surpass the Jewish ones. It's not a new law. It is a different, it's a different upcoming era in which God provides new merciful assistance to Israel enabling human beings to follow the existing law by way of an interior transformation of the heart. Some of our brothers and sisters in the Christian faith use scripture like this to say that we are the true religion. Of course, we know God still works through many religions, many ways. This is the way that we as Christians tell our story, how we live into the covenant that God has made with us. And just because we have something doesn't mean it's taken away from others. The covenant is often defined as sacred promise between two people with God in the midst. With this reading, we are given a definition that a covenant is something that each party enters for the sake of the other. It's not for one's own protection or rights, but for the sake of the other. We know that's true of God. Is it true for us? Do we do, do, we do anything purely for God's own sake? This core testimony, this core memory is that the God who judges is the God who brings well-being. This God is telling us something, good news, a word of comfort and hope. God has compassion on the people. God's heart has been touched by the suffering of God's people, and God loves them. God loves us and forgives us. We know suffering and abandonment. We know exile and loss. We face death, our own and the deaths of those we love. We know brokenness. We are a people of Good Friday. The story of Jesus' death is imbued with a kind of sacred, subversive irony. They thought they were burying him in a grave, but actually they were planting him like a seed. They thought they were killing him to ward off the Romans, but actually they were making possible a new harvest of much fruit. This kind of sacred irony is itself a comfort, since it suggests that God can work through even the worst we can do redeeming and remaking what seems irredeemable into the service of new life. The cross is an act of subversive, redemptive, divine irony. One of the most worst, one of the worst objects on earth remade into one of the best. That's why we're people of Easter Sunday. We taste forgiveness. We taste hope. We taste new life. We catch sight of it here and there. We get a word of it. We listen and wait and hope. We remember that we are dust or stardust and 
to stardust we shall return. And yet we know ourselves as bound for glory, pain and hope, dying and rising again, all humankind waiting, waiting here in the unresolved, the waiting. So even though we're people of Good Friday and we are people of Easter Sunday, we also find ourselves in that mysterious Holy Saturday, staying in the unresolved, having faith, trusting that Easter comes because God writes this in our hearts and in our whole lives. The covenant is not just a movement towards individualism. It's a powerful reminder that we are part of something greater than ourselves. This covenant made in Jeremiah is a promise to Israel and Judah, to people who find themselves struggling sometimes to follow, to make things new. It is a promise that God continues to mark our hearts and make our hearts new and right. Deep within, God plants God's law. Always, again, new life deep in our hearts. May it be so in your life and in mine. Amen. Dear God, you are holy mystery, but bigger than ourselves. Hear our prayers, even those unspoken and held deep within. Our lives are full of change. Some change is easy, some change is very difficult to live with. Holy One, you and your love are the constant in our lives. Your steadfast love never ceases. Your love invites us to grow. You have written love on our hearts. Help strengthen our hearts to respond with love in all situations. The Lord be with you all. And let us pray. God, help us to continue moving towards right relationship and reconciliation with our indigenous neighbors, the first people who lived here. Help us change our systems so that they don't privilege white European heritage over others, but instead focus on restoring justice. Help us change ourselves to be open to learning from elders and from those different than ourselves. 
We pray for the safety, appreciation, and empowerment of people of color, people of the global majority in our Burnaby community. We also pray for the safe and just distribution of the COVID vaccines. We give thanks for the dedication and work of our healthcare workers and pray for improvement in their working conditions and pay. We pray for strength and healing of those who are dealing with any health or mental health issue. We pray for our seniors and their caregivers. We pray for the youth and young adults and their mental health and their supporters. We also pray for those who live with grief, that their burdens may be lightened and that the light of love will sustain them. God, we pray for the wise use of our Jubilee resources to uplift the most vulnerable in our community. We give thanks for shelter, for food, for staff and for volunteers. We give thanks for friendship and relationship that strengthen our community and people. In our Jubilee Faith community, we pray for those who are not able to be with us this morning and for those of our congregation who are dealing with struggles of their own. Jesus, we pray for your church that we remain relevant and helpful rather than hurtful in people's lives. We pray that God's love will be seen in our own authentic love for others. God, hear our prayers and help us heal the environment and the people through your abundant and gracious gifts. Let us now take all these prayers, those that are said aloud and those in our hearts, and fold them into the one that Jesus taught us to pray, as we say together. Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Today we will have fellowship time following our worship, and this Wednesday evening at 7, you're welcome to join in a fellowship time as well. This coming Wednesday at noon is our final Lenten series, 21 Things You Might Not Know About the Indian Act. You're welcome to join us, even if you haven't been part of it up till this point. Uh, this, if you are willing to do a testimonial about your faith journey for some time during the Easter season, which starts in two weeks, please let me know. Uh, it would be great to have some voices to share those stories that I know people want to hear. And on April 2nd at 1030, which is Good Friday, all of the Burnaby United Churches will worship together uh, in a joint Good Friday worship service. You're welcome to join us in those. This week, we have two birthdays coming up. We'll be celebrating the birthday of Elfrin and of Brenna. And now, Brenna, you're the one that makes most of the cards for everyone. So people are going to have to do something and get a card to you somehow this week. Thanks for all that you have done and happy birthday to both of you. Friends, we're grateful for whatever you are able to offer in the ways that you offer of yourselves, in the gifts that you have, in the crafts that you make, in the things that you do, in the money you are able to donate. If you're able and wish to contribute financially to the life of Jubilee United Church, there are a variety of ways. I think you probably know these already, but I'm going to tell you anyways, 
you can drop off or mail in a check or someone will come by and pick it up from your house if that makes it easier for you. We have a pre-authorized remittance program that you can join whereby your money comes out of your bank account once a month. You can e-transfer to the office if you have access to that technology. We know some of you regularly worship other places and they need your continued support. We're grateful that you are with us for worship and that we're able to provide this space and time and we're glad that you're able to do that for all of you, for all that you offer. We are grateful for your generosity. Let us pray. God of the wilderness, we give these offerings in gratitude, rejoicing in the abundance of your gifts to us. We give them in faith, trusting that you will provide for our needs. We give them in hope, knowing that you can use them to spread love in this world. May we live with generous hearts, with open hands. Amen. It is never promised that you will not be tempted, nor thrown into turmoil, nor stumble or fall, but that by grace you will be saved through trusting God. Grace is a free gift of God, gift, ongoing gift for me and for you. You have a destiny to inherit over which the angels in heaven marvel. And so the quiet strength of Christ, the humble power of God, and the pervasive light of the Spirit continue to be yours today and always. Thanks be to God. Amen.